When I was 19, I moved from Oregon to Florida to be with my boyfriend at the time. I was thinking white sand beaches and Mickey Mouse, but instead got the swamps, bugs, and dirt roads. It was a huge shock to the system. We lived in this dinky little town called Hawthorne, just outside of Gainesville. Very small, one-stop light and four stores. Dollar General, Steve's Market, Eckerd's Pharmacy, and Sunny BBQ. Whoopee. I got a job at the now-defunct Eckerd's in the middle of the town. It was next to the grocery store, so everyone shopped there. After about three months or so working there, I walked in to start my shift one day when the manager pulled me into his office. Laid out on his desk was about 30 to 40 open letters, all dressed by hand, to me. Do you know this person? My manager asked. No, I thought to myself. Read one. So I picked the cheerful yellow one. Inside were two handwritten letters and a magazine cut out of a woman with long blonde hair, just like me. As the Eckerd manager watched on, I read the letter. I skipped around a lot of confusion, desperately trying to find out why I'm in this room. From what I read, it was mostly someone imagining what spending time with me would be like. There were descriptions and comments about my hair, washing it, smelling it, and something about the moonlight. A few sentences were highlighted, others were underlined. My first thought was, am I getting fired? Do you know this David Elrod? Hair. I said yes, I think so. The tall, lanky guy with thick glasses and frizzy, dark blonde hair. The regular who comes in a couple of times a week to pick up a Diet Coke and medication for his mom. Late 20s and obviously socially or mentally challenged. On rare occasions, he would make small talk as I rang up his soda. Once or twice, he would linger at my register or stare at me, but I figured he was just trying to adjust his eyes or had poor social cues. Harmless, compared to some of the other people I've met here in Florida, so I didn't pay him any mind. Until that day in the Eckerd's office. I knew he wrote the letters because of a strange encounter two weeks earlier. While working, he came up behind me and caressed my hair. I had to remove it from his hands and he apologized. Weird. No harm. I went back to work. After telling my manager this, he informed me that the customer was going to be banned from the store and I was being sent home while they worked out the details. What details? Confused, I walked out of the store and drove home. Strange. Two hours after I got home from my non-shift at work, there was a knock at the door. I look out my window and see what resembles a SWAT team. I saw men in tactical gear with large weapons, two men dressed in suits and several uniformed cops, and what seemed like slow motion at the time, I opened the door. A female officer holds up a few oddly familiar letters. Can we come in and talk to you about these? Realizing everyone in town had read the letters, I wanted to pass out. I don't even know the guy. We have a seat on my couch and she begins to speak. Out of the corner of my eye, I see my boyfriend shooting me dirty looks from the bedroom. The female officer mentions getting the letters from Eckerd's and attempting to issue a trespassing notice. They wanted to speak to him directly, she says, because her whole department is aware of David. The officers confronted him at his residence and attempted to evoke the trespassing notice from Eckerd's store. Apparently, he was not happy about this. He insisted for over 45 minutes how this was all a big mistake and I wanted to talk to him. He was so combative and persistent, they decided to pursue stalking charges. Stalking charges, I thought. She continues, You need to be aware that David killed and partially dismembered his mother when he was 12 years old. He was released from a juvenile psychiatric facility less than four years ago. Diet Coke. We found disturbing materials at his house, she continued. We believe he's been stalking you. My mind kept wondering. This is my mom's favorite drink, he would say. David was arrested the next day for stalking after he was found in the Eckerd's parking lot, but the last official word was he went back to the psychiatric hospital, at least temporarily. I didn't have the chance to read the letters in full before they were entered into some vault of evidence, nor did they explain what they found at his house, so I never had the complete picture of what was happening. My boyfriend at the time was a huge idiot about the whole thing, so I moved back to Oregon a week later. Besides, who wants to hang around when Norman Bates is fixated on you?
I live in Florida, and this incident happened about three weeks after Hurricane Irma. Back in July, the ex and I had just finalized the divorce, and I moved into a gated neighborhood where every house was rented out by the same rental company and landlords. It's a very small neighborhood with about 15 houses tops. All 15 houses are bordered around a man-made lake with the backyards facing the lake. No one really has a fenced backyard. When you walk out of your back door, you see the lake in front of you and your neighbor's backyard on each side of you. Everyone in the neighborhood seemed very close. Someone was always hosting a family-friendly party or barbecue or having people over to watch sports. I was, and am still depressed about my divorce, so I never partook in these social gatherings. The only person I got to know was my next-door neighbor, Steve, an active Navy soldier with a huge love for guns. Steve is the true hero in this nightmare. My daughter Alice is four years old, and I get her every weekend. Alice's bedroom window faces the backyard towards the lake. I spoil that girl to death. She truly is my everything, and I count down the days to the weekend every week just to be with her. That's why I was upset when Irma came and I had to go almost three weekends without seeing her. The weekend before the storm, she was with her mom. Then obviously the weekend of the storm, she was with her mom. Then on top of that, the weekend after, she had to be with her mom because my power was still out. No AC in Florida is miserable. The humidity was so bad that week that I slept in my daughter's room the whole week because she was the only room with a window that faced the lake. I opened the window, exposing just the window screen, so the wind from the lake could cool the room as much as possible while I slept. Eventually the power comes back and Alice starts visiting me again like normal. That was when the nightmare started. My daughter would explain about the singing lady and how she doesn't like her anymore. I thought maybe she was referring to one of my ex's friends or one of the teachers at her school. Maybe there was a teacher at her school that sang to the kids and that she didn't like it. But that Saturday night, Alice woke up in the middle of the night screaming bloody murder. I ran into her room and turned on the light and found her hiding under her covers. I asked her what was wrong and all she could do was point to an empty corner of her room and yell, look, look. There was nothing there. She was acting as if though she had seen a ghost. After I calmed her down, she started to talk about the singing lady again. Please tell the singing lady not to come back. Please, daddy, make her go away, she would say. Obviously, she is having nightmares, right? I showed her that there was nothing in the closet and nothing under the bed and that there was nothing to be afraid of. She calmed down and went back to sleep. I went back to my room and quickly fell back asleep as well. It couldn't have been more than 20 minutes before Alice comes running into my room screaming. She's back. She's back. Alice absolutely refused to go back to her room, so I let her sleep with me. The next morning, Sunday morning, I took Alice out to breakfast and we stopped by Target to pick up a baby monitor. I haven't used one since her and her mom and I were still married, but I wanted to easily be able to hear her and if and when she was having nightmares again so I could respond quicker. After I set them up, I showed Alice how they worked to give her assurance that I could hear her and she was safe. That night, she slept soundly and didn't make a peep all night. The following weekend, Alice had to stay with her mother again because she had caught a stomach virus from one of her little friends at school. It was Saturday night and I was sound asleep in my bed. Around 2am is when I heard it, a woman's voice humming a soft nursery rhyme through the baby monitor. The humming and soft singing got louder and clearer as the voice got closer to the monitor. I wasn't dreaming. I could hear a woman softly singing lullabies in my daughter's bedroom. I had never been so scared and dumbfounded in my life. I was feeling a mixture of pure terror and disbelief. Then the voice spoke out. Alice, sweetie, are you awake? Adrenaline shot through my veins. I jumped out of bed and locked my bedroom door. I picked up my cell and called Steve from next door. He didn't waste a second. As soon as I got off the phone with him, I heard him storm out of his back door screaming, Don't you move! I ran outside and found him aiming his shotgun at a woman crouched outside my daughter's window, the one I had left open after Irma and never closed. Steve quickly dropped his guard when he recognized the woman. It was Jean the neighborhood maintenance woman. Steve's wife came running out after him and confirmed it was her. Jean played dumb. She said she was not singing and didn't even know my daughter's name. 
She said she was near my daughter's window because she was doing her weekly patrol for gators and thought she saw one approaching her house from the lake. Full of crap. That chick was singing, and she called out to my daughter by name. Yes, it's true that there have been a few gator spottings around the neighborhood, and yes, part of Jean's job was to patrol the lake at night every now and then. But at 2 a.m.? I obviously knew it was bullcrap, and even though neither Steve or his wife called her out on it, I could tell by the look on their faces that they didn't believe her either. The next morning, I went over to Steve's house to thank him and tell him exactly what happened. He told me Jean and her husband had been known to be a little cuckoo, but this is by far the craziest thing to have happened so far. Steve helped me install metal bars on Alice's window that afternoon. I'm a proud Floridian. At the time of the story, in the early 2000s, I was going to college in South Florida and lived with my family in my hometown in the Florida Panhandle. It was about a seven hour drive up through central Florida to get between the two places, so I mostly only went home for the holidays. It was the Thanksgiving of my junior year and I was excited that I had managed to rearrange my midterms to be able to leave campus three days ahead of everyone else. I was hoping to beat the masses of traffic and was hoping for a quick trip back home. My roommates wanted to have a last meal together before we all left for break, so I ate in the campus dining hall at around 4 p.m., and I set off on my journey back home at around 5.30. Around 10 p.m. I had just passed my two-thirds mark, where I always stopped at this little mom-and-pops type of diner by the side of the highway to grab a snack, use the restroom, and call my dad to let him know I was okay. I didn't have a cell phone yet. Well, I hadn't been there since summer, and the place was out of business, so a little bummed out that I wasn't getting my chocolate chip pancakes, I just kept going. There really wasn't much build up around there at that time, so when I saw signs for a rest stop in, of all places on God's green earth, some little town called Alachua, I went for it. So I went and parked directly under the streetlight for safety and used the facilities, called my dad, etc, etc. I didn't see anyone else there, except for a very exhausted looking woman who approached me asking for directions, saying she was with her husband and two small children from Virginia and they had made a wrong turn trying to get to Disney. So I left the rest area and was walking back to my car, when I noticed a beat up, unmarked, grayish, bluish work van parked incredibly close to the driver's side of my 95 Honda Civic. Yeah, okay, I thought that's pretty weird. It had Florida tags on it, so it couldn't have been the ladies I had talked to in the bathroom. I distinctly remembered she said she was from Virginia. I turned around and hightailed it back to the rest stop, promptly running into some random middle-aged guy with two little boys. Getting to talk to him, it turned out it was his wife I had spoken to, as she emerged from the bathroom a second later, and I felt comfortable speaking to him. I told him what was going on with the van and how I didn't know what to do. He said he'd go check it out, so he left the kids with his wife and strutted up to the driver's side of the van. He stood there for a moment before speaking, his voice awkwardly quivered, but we could hear him yell it from where we were standing some hundred feet away. Excuse me, gentlemen, uh, we already called the police, so I'm going to have to politely suggest that you get out of here. And then he ran back to us, grabbed his wife and his kids, pointed to me with a swift, you, and said, come on, let's all get in the car now. And we ran together. So here I was, confusedly sitting in the back of the stranger's SUV, while he went and used the payphone to presumably call the police. Meanwhile, the van peeled out of there, like I've never seen someone get out of there quite like they had gotten out of there. They ran up on the curb on their way out. It burned rubber. It was almost comical. The cops got there and I found out what had happened. The man went to go check out the van. He could see in it pretty well because I had parked under the streetlight. The first thing he noticed was that all of the seats except for the driver's seat had been removed, and there was a guy sitting in the driver's seat and a guy sitting in the back, a tarp laid out in the back, and a bunch of random items back there he couldn't immediately identify. Neither of the guys were reading a newspaper or a map or anything. They were apparently both just sitting there. It still makes me sick thinking about it.
I was around five or six when this happened, and although some things are a little hard to recall, please forgive me as I attempt to translate memories of my childhood self along with what my mother and sister have told me since the terror instilled in me from this ordeal still remains. Maybe this will prove to be therapeutic. And this happened in 1990 and 1991. My mother suffers from bipolar disorder and did not like to take her medication because she felt cloudy and numb on it. She's originally from Thailand and she always told me, it's America that makes me crazy. She'd often self-medicate with booze and cigarettes. She even kept a mason jar under the sink of something red that she had made herself. No idea what it was, but it smelled awful and she called it Mommy's Kool-Aid. She told me I was not to touch it, taste it, and definitely not to tell my dad. And since I was the world's pickiest eater, who hardly ever saw my busy father, that was never a problem. My dad was in the military and he would often go on TDYs out of the country, so my older sister and I were left at home with our mother, who was for the most part perfectly capable of caring for us, but, you know, she had her bad days, as all parents must, complete with off-the-chart mood swings that fluctuated between laying on the couch all day to wanting to play hide-and-seek with us and chasing anyone she found with a large kitchen knife. You know, typical childhood. Sometimes she'd go to Tampa for a few days to gamble or party with friends that she had made, most of them also from Thailand or the Philippines. They all seemed outgoing and loud, like my mom. I watched a lot of TV when I was little and just assumed that's how real life was or should be, and no one on TV acted like my mommy, so I just thought she was a huge weirdo. I was always embarrassed at how people reacted to her because that's how my dad and sister acted and being so young, I didn't have much compassion or understanding. I wanted her to be like the TV mom and it didn't help that my dad was always berating her for acting crazy and that she had to be careful while he was gone and straighten up or the state's going to take our kids away. My dad looked down on her and after a while I followed his example. I can't believe I did that and I am totally ashamed of myself but I can only blame my youth and ignorance. One day, I remember she was in a super good mood but super distracted. She was curling her hair, putting on lipstick, jewelry, and her perfume was in the air. Offhandedly, she informed us she was going to Tampa. I was a little confused because my dad was still gone on TDY and wouldn't be back for another week and we had school in the morning. She'd never left us when those things were going on and I'd never had to get ready for school without my mom. Not ever. She even took me there on her bicycle because I could still fit into the toddler seat on the back. When she saw my panic face, she reassured me that she just wanted to go see a friend who was having a birthday party and that she would be back in the morning to take me to school. My sister was eight years older than me, so she was for the most part competent enough to look after me, but I wasn't looking forward to being left with her because she bullied me. I suspect it was due to my mom always favoring the baby, me at the time, and since I was super duper small for my age, that's how everyone treated me. I should mention that although she was a huge bully to me, my sister also had this tremendous and oftentimes irrational fear that since I was so small, I could easily be kidnapped and she always drilled me with questions on the daily about how to deal with strangers and what to do if anyone ever tried to take me with them. She'd even have mock drills where she'd pretend to be a stranger by wearing this awful latex mask that I hated and making me run while timing me with her stopwatch and making me do it all over if I was too slow or tricking me and popping out of nowhere saying stuff like, congratulations, you're kidnapped. It was ridiculous and I hated feeling like I always had to watch my back. I learned later on in my life she did this because she and my mom had to thwart two would-be kidnappers on two separate occasions. So anyways, my mom drove away to Tampa and my sister watched TV while I played with my pound puppies. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. No tricks and teasing. I didn't even give her any tood when she told me to go to bed. I always slept with my closet light on and my pound puppies. After positioning them all around my pillow, I settled into bed and fell asleep. I awoke suddenly because I was being shaken roughly awake by my sister, who was hissing my name through gritted teeth. I was so confused. What time was it? Had it only been a few minutes or hours since I'd come to bed? My mom always woke me up for school, but I had a clock radio by my bed that read six something, and although my window shades were down, I could see traces of soft blue pre-dawn. My sister pulled me out of bed and whispered furiously for me to get dressed. I was completely dismayed. 
Where was mom? Why was my sister whispering? Why was she so mad? I would soon learn later she wasn't mad. She was terrified. She got down on her knees so that her face was about an inch away from mine and looked right into my eyes and whispered as calmly as she could, There's a man sleeping on the couch. I'm going to take you downstairs and I want you to run through the backyard and go to Kathy's, our neighbor, and have her take you to school. Great. After a whole night of not being timed or having to run and hide in less than 15 seconds, she was at it again. I was a big fan of rolling my eyes at this age, so that's what I did. My sister gaped at me. I informed her loudly that I didn't believe her and asked her where mom was. She covered my mouth and whispered that mom wasn't home. Then she walked me over to the staircase, picked me up, and we slowly descended the stairs. I realized she was trying not to make the stairs creak and I craned my neck around to see in the living room and to my satisfaction, there wasn't anyone on the couch. I looked at her triumphantly like, yeah right, who's on the couch? But she shook her head and pointed down where the family room was by the garage and half bath which was on the lower level of the first story, not a basement, just like a down a hallway of four steps. After opening the door to this hallway, she put me down at the foot of these steps and motioned for me to go forward. We had thick curtains drawn in this room, and they were on orange and white and brown floral prints, so their outlines practically glowed as the sun came up behind them, and as my eyes adjusted, I made out a figure on our smaller couch who was turned away from us, facing the couch back. At first glance, I thought it was my mother because of the long hair and tan skin, but the hair on the back of my neck prickled, as I realized this person was all balled up and seemed crammed into the couch, meaning they were a lot taller than my mother. Their shoulders were broader, and they were wearing dirty sneakers and painted stained jeans that were loose, like a man's, because it was a man. I started shaking all over. This had never happened before, and my parents weren't here and I had no idea what to do. My sister put her hand back over my mouth and ran me back up the stairs, she closed the door quietly and pushed the lock button on it. She had locked him down there, which made me feel a little bit better. I put a lot of trust into locked doors. My sister took me to the kitchen and gave me my book bag, but not my lunchbox, and as I was about to inform her of this, she opened the backyard porch door and gave me the solemn look, so I shut up. She told me to run as fast as I could, not to stop until I got there, and not to tell anyone about the man because she was going to take care of it. She helped me put on my backpack, then counted to three, just like in all the drills she made me do, and I took off. I dodged my dogs, I unlatched the chain link gate, I ran down the back walkway toward the driveway across the front yard and off our property. I wasn't allowed to cross the street, but here, I was crossing it, flying across it even. I ran through other people's yards that were still wet with dew and didn't stop until I was knocking as hard as I could on Kathy's front door. Kathy opened the door in her bathrobe and her hair all mussy and I told her she had to take me to school. That's all I said. She gave me a look like, oh do I now, before letting me in. I sat in her kitchen as she offered me breakfast food I wouldn't eat and got her kids ready for daycare. I'm sure she asked me why she had to take me to school but I can't really remember the conversation. I think I just told her that my mom wasn't home and she just left it at that. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about my mom. Mostly she was always out in the yard gardening and being super friendly, but they all had to take care of my sister and I at some point, just like my mom would take care of their kids when they went out to run errands. This was the only time in my life I felt like neighbors were just automatic friends. I went to school and didn't have lunch, so the receptionist gave me a quarter to buy PB&J and milk, which I didn't need or drink, but knew I had to take so the school wouldn't look like they weren't taking care of me. Once I was talking with my friends, all recollection of the events of that morning faded from my mind. It wasn't until after school that I remembered everything because I didn't see my mom's van waiting for me. I didn't see her on her bike or waving an umbrella at me. I didn't see Kathy or my sister or anyone that was there for me. I stood there looking and thinking I could probably walk home, but I was terrified of having to do that simply because I never had, but more because I was always told that I wasn't supposed to. There was a boy in my class with white blonde hair who lived in my neighborhood and he was staring at me. I felt uncomfortable and turned away trying to look like I belonged there and that everything was okay but 
I caught the attention of his father who had been helping his younger kids onto their bicycles. Honey, where's your mommy? He asked me. I didn't want to lie, but I also didn't want to confess that I didn't know. I didn't want them to know about all the weird stuff that was happening because if they told other people or my teacher or the police, I didn't want my mom to get in trouble and I didn't want to get in trouble either. Do you want to walk with us? She lives close, right? He asked his son, who nodded. He made his son walk his bike and keep pace with me while we watched his younger kids. I think this kid asked me where my mom was, but I don't know what I told him or if I told him anything because I knew his dad was listening. I think I said that my sister was supposed to come get me so the issue would be minimized to an irresponsible older sibling and not all-out parental abandonment. I think children that are raised around the threat of impending instability are quick on their feet with responses like that, or they just play dumb. Once we got to my house, I ran up the driveway as the father watched, waiting to have responsibility relinquished, but I noticed with sinking stomach that the garage was down, which meant my mom's van was not in it, which meant my mom was not there. I froze, fearing discovery, wondering if I could just wave goodbye and go to the backyard and sit in my playhouse, but almost as if by magic, I saw my sister turn in the driveway on her bicycle. The dad gave her major disapproving side eye and they talked a bit, and then he smiled at me and they all waved goodbye. She ran up to me and grabbed my hand so I followed her up the walkway towards the stairs of our front porch and went into our house. I asked her if the man was still here and she said no. She told me after she saw that I made it to the neighbors, she went back down to the family room with the biggest knife she could find. She kicked the cushions to wake the guy up and yelled, Who are you? And what are you doing in my house? And he, seeing her towering above him with this knife and being super disoriented, probably hung over, screamed in bloody terror and cowered behind some pillows. I I'm a friend of your mom's, he told her. She told me to look after you. I, I folded the clothes. I folded the clothes. My sister then pointed the knife at him and told him to get up slowly. She waved at his face and told him to get out, which he was only too happy to do. He managed to unlock and pull open the sliding door in the family room, which we never used because it was too hard for anyone but my father to shut all the way, and she said the dogs jumped on him, trying to be friendly. Spaniels love everyone, the dummies. But he just thought that they were going to attack him, so he picked up the pace as he climbed over the chain-link fence and disappeared. After locking everything up, so she thought, my sister said the phone rang and it was her mother. She said mom sounded drunk and asked her if we met her friend, and my sister flipped out on her. Our mother could not understand why she was so upset and explained that she was driving a few friends home when they met a real live Seminole walking down the road as they pulled over and harassed him long enough to find out he didn't have a place to stay that night. So being in a super good mood, since she loves making new friends, my mom told him he could stay at her house, but he had to fold some laundry and watch her kids so she could stay out and keep partying, and he agreed. She let him in through the garage, told him where to find the basket of laundry, which I do recall seeing, neatly folded by the couch in the family room, and told him there's some beers in the fridge, but not to go up to the second story. My sister said it like she said, well, I told him not to go upstairs, like that ensured our safety or something. I wish I could end the story on a happy note, because that right there seems like a great place to end it. It's kind of light and funny even, but sadly no. That weekend, my sister asked to sleep over at a friend's house and my mom let her. She always let us do stuff like that and she was always being extra nice to us, I guess because of what happened earlier that week. She even told me I could have someone sleep over, so I called all my friends from best to worst, around 8 to 9 p.m., invited them to come sleep over. No notice at all is just how I rolled and... And though I expected that they would all jump at the chance, sadly, one by one, their parents all said no. I kept trying to come up with more girls in my class that I could call until my mom told me it was too late and past my bedtime, so I made my way up the stairs full of the pouts. She asked if I wanted to sleep in her room and have a sleepover with her, but I just whined no, as mean as I could, and got ready for bed. All the energy I was putting into being a huge brat must have been exhausting because I fell asleep immediately. I woke up with a startle because my dogs were barking in the backyard. I remember I opened my eyes and instantly felt strange. It was pitch black. That shouldn't be. My closet light was always on. Always. Sometimes my dad would turn it off before he left work early in the morning, but 
I always woke up and turned it back on, even if the sun was almost up and I could see around in my room. When I was in bed, the closet light was on. Period. Besides, it was not only early in the morning this time and my dad was not home. I got super angry. Who turned out my light, I thought. I stared into the black until my eyes adjusted enough that I saw the darker black rectangle of my open bedroom door. I always left my door wide open, but in the dark, it looked like it was opening into a void, and anything or nothing was just through it. My anger faded and I started to shake. I decided to leave the safety of my covers, walk over to my closet, and flip the switch back on. That would set everything right. I made my way over to the closet, felt around on the wall until I felt the switch and flipped it. Nothing. I flipped it off, then on again. Repeat, repeat. Nothing. It was still dark. I noticed the clock radio wasn't on either, and the lamppost by our mailbox wasn't emitting any light through my window shade either. My hopes sank as I came to the realization that the electricity was out. It wasn't storming, so it must have been the breaker box. I knew it was outside because sometimes I'd run a bath and water would stay cold, so my dad would go out to the backyard to wherever the thing was and flip it for me. I instantly regretted not sleeping in my mom's room and was deciding whether or not to be brave and feel my way down the hall to it. But I never had a chance to do this because suddenly I heard thumping like someone was trudging around downstairs. If it was Christmas Eve, I would have been stoked, but it wasn't, and I knew that wasn't Santa. Maybe it was my mom trying to turn the electricity back on, but that seemed unlikely somehow. I backed away from my closet toward the foot of my bed where I kept all of my big stuffed animals propped against it and sat on top of them until the weight shifted them back and I sank into them. I felt safer having them all around me and only my head peeped through. I reached up my bed and pulled the covers down so they hung over the edge and covered my head so I could just peek through. If you walked into my room, the bed would be in the far right corner and the closet would be directly across from it on the same wall as the door. The door swung open to the right, so where I was, I couldn't see down the hallway anymore, but I could see through a crack of black by the hinges. I heard the trudging get louder until it was coming up the stairs. Once you got to the top, you could either go left to the bathroom in my parents' room or right toward my sister's room or my room. I wondered where this person would go, and I noticed there was a movement through the hinge crack coming toward my door, so I held my breath and closed my eyes tight. Whoever it was came in slowly, as if they weren't sure about their surroundings. I heard them stop, then move over to my bed. I smelled something like mommy's Kool-Aid and heard them grab my pillow, then toss it toward the closet. I know because it hit me in the head and then tumbled to the floor. The pound puppies must have gone flying because I heard the soft pit-pat of them landing around me, and after a pause that seemed to last forever, but was probably more like 15 seconds, whoever walked out and went into my sister's room, shutting her door behind them. My first reaction was to run to my mom's room because I was scared this person would soon discover the room was empty and come out quickly, so I got up and looked down the hallway. I heard something faintly down at the end, so I ducked down by my rocking chair. From this vantage point, I was able to see directly down the hallway, but I couldn't really see anything down it at all. It was just a big black space. I always threw all my clothes on this rocking chair, so I got down low under where they were draped and stared in front of me. I remember feeling the strain of my eyes dilating not knowing that's what they were doing as I watched the black rectangle of my doorway change ever so slightly. There was something darker, something moving towards me. It was close to the ground and sounded like a scurrying animal crawling on all fours, but I knew it was deceptively small in its posture, and all I could do was stare in horror as it came closer and closer, this thing that was darker than the dark. I watched it as it crawled over to my bed and heard it as it felt all over the sheets and covers. My teeth started chattering as I realized it was searching for me. It started feeling around the floor under the bed, touching my stuffed animals and as it got closer to me, I let out a small gasp. It stopped and turned toward me. Suddenly I felt a hand on my face, another on my shoulder, and someone was pulling me out from under the drapes of my clothing and pulling me against them, holding me. They were shaking too and I realized it was my mother. She knew her way around her house in the dark and suddenly we were gliding down the stairs and out the front door into the cool night air 
running across the yard in our PJs to our next door neighbors who let us in and called the cops. My mom wouldn't let me go outside with her while she talked to the police but told me later, the guy, her friend who my sister had kicked out, had returned because he was furious at her for being unforgivably rude and my mom, who had felt had cheated him out of their deal. He knew our dad wasn't home and since our breaker box was located outside, he managed to turn off our power, come back in through the sliding door my sister hadn't managed to lock, thinking he'd scare us and make my mom apologize or something. That's what my mom told us that the police had told her. She said that when they pulled him in and handcuffed him, he kept repeating, but I folded the clothes. She still to this day tries to make it into a joke by imitating him when my sis and I cringe, although lately I find myself wanting to laugh with her. Maybe someday I will. I'm thankful that no one was hurt and that my dad installed a security system and got a breaker box lock, but unfortunately afterwards he hospitalized my mom and told her she had to take her medication every day or he'd leave her in there. She agreed, but they ended up divorced five years later, and it took my entire childhood before I could understand and forgive them. I'm still working on learning how to forgive myself, but I imagine a lot of people are in the same boat as me. Looking back on that time now, I'm just so relieved my sister wasn't home because who knows what that guy had planned. This happened almost two years ago when I was 22. I live in an area outside of Pittsburgh. I was single at the time and the only thing I wanted to do was have fun and forget about my ex. I should say that I am a very cautious person, verging on the paranoid sometimes. I've never even broken a bone. I never trusted anyone I didn't know. I learned my lessons very young. So I felt very equipped to go out by myself to the local bar because I knew how to make the environment safe. I made fast friends with the bartenders, got along with the regular guys there as well. I made it very clear to everyone that I didn't want any sort of romantic attention. I literally just wanted friends and booze. Out of all the men there, one stuck out. Phil was attractive, funny, and best of all, wasn't interested in me one bit. I had problems having male friends as all of them always girlfriend zoned me eventually. Phil actually liked having me as a friend, nothing else. It was awesome. We went to the local bars all the time together. I'd be his wingman, he'd be my bodyguard. When guys hung around me too long and I wasn't interested, if Phil gave a look, he'd usher the guy away. Perfect setup. We both felt pretty safe no matter where we went, but neither of us saw this one coming. A few months into our friendship, Phil rings me and asks me if I wanted to go cosmic bowling. Emphatic yes. I hadn't been since I'd been a preteen, so I was really stoked. I get ready, I did my makeup very bright and expressive, threw on a bright blue shirt and overall shorts. I don't wear them anymore, I don't know what I was thinking, and some black combat boots and I'm good to go. The car that pulls up isn't Phil's. I call him and cautiously ask who is in front of my house and he says to come on out and that it's a few of his friends. This reassures me and I head to the rather large Ford SUV. I sit next to Phil and he introduces me to everyone. The man driving is Jason. His girlfriend is in the passenger seat, there's some gross kid in the fedora and this goofy hillbilly kid, not uncommon outside of Pittsburgh. They say they were going to a few towns over, that's where there's a bar we're stopping at first then bowling. Cool, I'm up for that. We get to the bar and it turns out Jason knows the bar owner and we drink for free and get a free pizza while we're at it. I went up to the front of the building for a smoke and turn around to find Jason walking up behind me. He shakes my hand and apologizes not introducing himself properly. I said it was fine and we made casual talk while we smoked. He expressed how much he loved my style. Burlesque rockabilly pinup is how I believe he described me. I thanked him and he began to tell me about the gay bar he DJs at and how his girlfriend isn't comfortable with the fact that he's bi. As a pansexual I can relate to what he's going through. I immediately feel more at ease with him. I tended to trust men who weren't straight more because I felt as though they were less of a threat, which was a mistake in hindsight. His girlfriend came out and seemed annoyed with me, but I treated her very nicely as I understood it's easy to get jealous. We've all been there. Fast forward to bowling. Phil is way too drunk and ends up getting thrown out of the bowling alley. His girlfriend comes up to pick him up and apologizes that she can't take me home as well. 
I tell them that it's okay and I'll be safe. Jason agreed to take me home. Fast forward, bowling is over and Jason decided to head back to the bar and have the owner reopen after hours for us. I thought that that was pretty freaking rad and that he had connections like that. They reopened the bar for us and Jason actually tended the bar. I sat and talked with the owner for a while while Jason fed me alcohol. I kept trying to refuse but he was really convincing. This shot tastes like a toasted marshmallow. You have to try it. Before I know it, I'm hammered. I don't remember much, but I do remember getting home safe, and I had made new friends. How exciting, I thought. Jason adds me on Facebook and invites me to the gay bar the very next day. I'm excited. I've never been to one he works at. I trusted him. The months go by and we were fast friends. I started to hang out with him without Phil. He would pick me up. I'd set up his DJ equipment at the bar and get him wherever he needed. Then party the night away and he'd take me home. Sometimes his girlfriend was there, but most times not. She didn't seem to like me still, but I was nothing but nice to her. It began to bother her. Maybe she saw something I didn't. Valentine's Day rolled around, and as I was the local single woman who hated everyone, Jason invited me to a burlesque show that he was going to be doing the lighting for. His girlfriend was going, and so was the hillbilly they mentioned earlier. Ten minutes into the adventure, and I already had to tell off the hillbilly. Just because it's Valentine's Day and you are single and going to the same club as I am, does not a date make. The show happens, it's long and eventually I get bored and head to the bar. Jason's girlfriend comes up to me and is silent. She buys two shots of tequila and hands me one. She clinks my glass and says, good luck, and we take our shots. I realize what she had said as she walked away and thought it was odd. The hillbilly drives me home. I wake up. 46 missed calls, 20-some texts from Jason. I call him, concerned. He doesn't seem upset. He says he just wanted to talk to me. That maybe he had a few too many to drink and he was sorry. Okay, I guess. No big deal. He wanted me to come help him take the lights out of the club. I agreed. He picked me up and something seemed off, but I couldn't place it. His face looked haggard. He talked like his emotions were stretched too thin. We get to the club and it's locked. He called the owners and they said they'd be there soon, within the hour. He seems very agitated and doesn't even want to get out of the car to walk around at the shops. He then ignores my attempt at conversation and calls someone on the phone, an EMT whom he's acquainted with. He's asking him for things to steal from the ambulance. It started off innocent enough. Gauze, bandages, tongue depressors, and eventually... Do you still have that leather restraints for mental patients? Do you guys have scalpels on the ambulance? One of those big needles, like the huge syringes. What about those pads that soak up fluid, like to put under a patient when they're bleeding, the full body ones? The phone was on speaker. I could hear the tension in the man's voice. He told him no to each request and was getting more and more nervous as this bizarre back and forth continued. Eventually the man hung up on Jason. I sat there trying not to seem conspicuous and he screamed in my face, What is your problem now? I smiled and said nothing was wrong, trying to diffuse whatever was going on with my friend. He laughed nervously and apologized, said he had a rough Valentine's Day and he was trying to get stuff for his friend's performance art piece and wasn't having any luck. I trusted him. After we took down the equipment, he took me to the gay bar and one of the male strippers took a liking to me. Long story short, I may or may not have had made a poor life choice that night. Anyway, the bar closes and Jason isn't talking to me. We get in his car and drive a little down the road and he explodes. How could you do that to me? Alice, how could you? He started to cry, swerving all over the road. Don't you have any respect? Any respect for me? I told him to mind his own business and pull over. I'm walking home and he follows me and I'm calling the police. I took out my phone and dialed 911 but didn't press send. Everything finally made sense that this was not a person who was my friend, and it's time to be strong and fight. He pulls over and lets me out, silently, and drives off. I call my father for a ride and he picks me up and asks what happened. I'm not a personal human. I'm not good at sharing. I only told my father that if a man with awful sideburns shows up at our door, bring a gun. Fast forward, I went to another bar with Phil. He was very protective of me after the incident never leaving me out of sight for long. I walked to the bathroom which was down a dark hall at this particular establishment and felt someone latch onto my arm. 
Jason. Internally, I was furious and scared, but on the outside, I did my best to remain calm. He looked dead inside, nothing in his eyes, just blank. I left Chrissy for you, Alice, I did. You did this to me, but that's okay, really, because we're going to be fine. You can also sleep with whoever you want. I know how you are, so it doesn't matter if it's girls or guys or what, I'm sorry. I let it get to me before. You're so amazing, I don't want to lose you. It's okay, it is. You can treat me like garbage if you have to, if that's what makes you happy. We're going to be together now, yes. You're perfect. I've always liked winter weddings. I let my rage get the better of me, and with as much venom in my voice as I could manage, I snarled. No, I'm not your girlfriend. I'm not, never have been, never will be attracted to you. You need to let go of me now, you pathetic little worm. He blinked and squeezed tighter and began to drag me towards the car. We're going to Florida now, and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. The next thing I know, I fall to the ground with him, and he let go. Phil was on top of him, beating the crap out of him. After he was satisfied, he took him by the shirt and dragged him out the door. A bartender helped me up. A few guys gathered around me and tried talking to me to calm me down. Some even apologized that they didn't see the confrontation in the hall go down. I didn't call the police because I wasn't thinking straight and didn't want Phil to get in trouble for beating him within an inch of his life. I don't know what his plans were with me down in Florida, but needless to say, I don't go out much anymore. I lived in Florida for a year when I was five, and I witnessed the special kind of crazy that the South has in store for a family from Cape Cod. The people I encountered were like the sights you see in Walmart at 2am. I'll start with the Bennett family. Kathy, the mother, met my mom at the bus stop and they became friends instantly. She invited my mother and father over to meet her husband, Rich, who at first thought my mother was a stripper and my dad a pimp. Kathy would repeat her sentences like a broken record and was almost completely illiterate. The daughter who was friends with my sister was very pleasant, except for the fact that she was verbally abusive to the grandmother. Rich was as redneck as it got, and the son never showered. My father was sent over to the Middle East for work reasons about halfway through the year we lived in Florida. During that time, Mom planned a trip for her and us kids to go to Universal Studios and Bush Gardens for a week. Kathy invited herself. My mother was nice to tell her no. When we got to the hotel, Kathy thought she was having a heart attack in the elevator. She wasn't. It was just flatulence. During our time in the park, we had to stop multiple times so Kathy could chain smoke. Our hotel rooms were connected, one for mom and Kathy and one for me and my siblings. The first night there, Kathy saw someone standing by the TV and asked my mom if she was up. She was asleep. That morning, my mother was dressing me in their room, and what I saw when I turned around is forever burned in my head. Kathy was in the nude. Now, this was a very large, older woman, so you can imagine the horror for a five-year-old. I quickly turned away and stared out the window until we left for Bush Gardens. The next night, my oldest sister witnessed Kathy come into the bedroom of our suite and sit on the table with the door open right in front of my sister. She also started dragging a chair back and forth for about an hour. We went back to Port Charlotte that morning because Kathy missed her kids. The next encounter was centered mainly around me. A boy who was in first grade moved on to our cul-de-sac and was drawn to me because I was, to him, perfect. Every day he would look in the windows of my house till I got up. My oldest sister dubbed him the window shopper. One day, me and Jessica, Kathy's daughter, went over to his house he started chasing me around with a knife till I finally slapped him and went home. One time he pinned me down and started kissing me, to which I responded with a swift kick in the balls. One time he brought a calendar filled with pictures of naked women to my house and I still don't understand why. On another occasion he pushed me into a mound of red ants. If you know anything about red ants in Florida, then you will understand why this was a very scary experience for me. I got up and threw him into the mound and kicked him in the stomach and ran inside to put bandages on my legs. He was a real creepy kid, and I'm so glad he wasn't a lot older than me because I think he would have tried to do something awful. 
I saw some posts on here from a guy talking about people he witnessed in Florida and just wanted to share my experience because they don't get much weirder than there. I was walking down the main street through Destin, Florida. Bright sunny day, me in a mini dress and flats and a jacket. Hey, this is Florida. This shouldn't be this big of a deal, right? So I'm walking along, and some guy in a white sedan pulls up next to me, asks me if I want to ride. I say no, and keep walking. Next crosswalk, I cross the street because I can see that he has pulled in a few blocks down. I keep walking. I can see the guy notice me, pulls out, drives down a ways, then turns around. He drives back toward me, slowing as he gets close. I ignore him and keep walking. He takes a right, turns around, and pulls out the next block down, right in front of me. As I walk in front of his car, he asks if I want to ride. I ignore him. He makes the same maneuver again, pulling in front of me two blocks down. As I walk in front of his car again, he asks if I want to ride. I turn on him and yelled, I've told you three times that I don't want to ride. I'm not a prostitute. If you bother me again, I will call the police. Now get lost. He drove by a couple of more times, but he didn't accost me again. Needless to say, I didn't wear a mini dress in that town again. A couple of years ago, I was in our neighboring town. Our town is small, so if you need anything, you have to drive 30 miles to the city to get it there. Interstate 75 runs to the center of this town. While I was there, I stopped at a local sub shop to pick up lunch. As I was heading to my truck, I saw an older Lexus drive past, and a man put his seat down all the way. I didn't see his face much, but I saw his sleeve tattooed arm in the window. I got to my truck, hopped inside when the Lexus pulled up a few spots away. There were no other cars around me. A scraggly, cracked out looking woman got out of the car and ran up to my truck. I locked the doors and I cracked the window because I had already seen the man trying to hide in their car. These folks are up to no good, I thought. The woman started talking a hundred miles a minute. She tells me that she and her daughter, she says she in the car sleeping, left her abusive relationship and they're on their way to Florida to stay with family. She asked if I had any money to help them out. I told her, sorry, I don't have any cash. She kept on talking, and I just kept on listening instead of driving away like I should have. She's in tears now and really putting on a show. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking, there is a man in your car, I saw him, but I didn't mention it. She asked me if she and her daughter could follow me to the ATM to get them some money since they were about out of gas. I told her again, sorry, no. I put my truck into drive and started to pull away. Her tears stopped, and she stormed off to her car. I don't remember exactly all of what she said. It was a long, fast-paced story, but looking back, her story made no sense. She said they were from a town that was south of where we were. If she was truly heading to Florida, she wouldn't be north of her destination. I am guessing they were drug addicts trying to scam a few bucks off of people in parking lots. If they were really smart, the guy would have stayed at home and sent her out on her own. If I hadn't have seen him in the car there's a good possibility I would have believed her story and given her some money to help her out. Hey friends, thanks for listening. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, or let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear it featured on the channel. And grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt, all links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.